Good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning on this Christmas Eve service that we are having here. We are going to have a Christmas evening, Christmas Eve evening service, uh, and I hope you're able to come out for that too. It's good to be here this morning. Before we actually uh, do our song here this morning, our hymn. Uh, we only have one actually on the list here today because of the many things that are going to be going on. We have somewhat of a, an extended message, I guess I should say, too, it's because it consists of some extra parts. Um, but I want to go to a video that I want to just share, and it pertains to the song that we're going to sing here in a few moments. It's a little bit different version, but it also details how that song came about. It was a long, cold winter of 1863. The war between the states raged mercilessly. Antietam, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, Chickamauga. Sons, fathers, and brothers from Mississippi to Maine had not come home for Christmas, and many would never return. Poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow sat in Cambridge, Massachusetts, pondering the state of the world around him. Longfellow had been widowed for two years since his wife's dress tragically caught fire, and his son, Charles, was now seriously wounded, having been injured on December 1st by a Confederate bullet at the Battle of New Hope Church. As he sat nursing his son on the long road to recovery, listening to the church bells pealing forth Christmas tidings, he struggled with the message of the angels proclaiming, Peace on earth, goodwill towards men, and he took up his pen and wrote.
Take your Bible. I'd like you to turn to Luke's Gospel. <laughs> Luke's writing, chapter 2. We're going to look at some scripture here, very similar to the words that we, we sang in our opening hymn and what we just heard as we played the video here right now. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding the field, keeping watch over the flock, their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were greatly afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And Lord, have blessing to the reading of his word here today. You know, the lesson I said we want to look at and just consider here for a few moments this morning involves the question. We might even be able to make it a serious question. What if Jesus had not come? Or if Jesus had not come? Jesus was, is, and always will be in a league of his own. In a place that no other could ever fill. You know, there are many today that are they're happy to, to give honor to him as a, a good teacher. You know, we hear that quite often. Many in Jesus' time period respected him for his knowledge of the written word. There are those that viewed him as a, a social reformer. One that was out there making a difference, making changes. The religious <laughs> leaders weren't too happy about some of the changes he appeared to be trying to make, and they came out against him. And there are some religions that even admit to the fact that Jesus was a great prophet. But you know, none of these things go far enough. Jesus is much more than that. He is the greatest of all messengers that has ever come, who has ever lived. Jesus was not just another prophet, as some would like to say that he is. He's not like those that actually came before him. In fact, John the Baptist, when Jesus came to him and asked to be baptized of John, John did not feel worthy to even baptize Jesus, even though John was communicating a message of needing to be born again. Jesus was not mere, merely just one who came with, with words of, of trying to correct a sin-sick, lost, wayward people. He was not just one we could call a, a moralist or a motivator. He was much more than that. He was and is distinctly different than anything or anyone. Jesus is the Father himself. He testified. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. He has come. In fact, on the Mount of Transfiguration, there was some words spoken by God himself that are pretty important for all of us to heed. In Mark's writings, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, 
And it came to pass in those days that Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized in John and Jordan. And immediately when he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him as a dove. Then a voice came forth. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And again, in the experience upon the mountain, these same words, and a cloud came on and overshadowed them as they were on the mountain, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Is the world hearing him today? Is the world hearing this child that was born in Bethlehem, this one that laid in a manger, this one that grew into adulthood, this one that communicated a need to repent, to be born again. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. You can't get any better than that. You can't get any greater than that. So Jesus surpasses anything and everything. God sent him to us. <coughs> God came in the person, in the body, in the form of man. There are no other contenders. But Jesus is not only the greatest messenger, he has the greatest of all messages. The message that he brings is a message that is trumpeting every message that has ever been spoken. What did the angels sing in verse 14? Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill to men. What are we searching for today? What does the world clamor for? Peace. Peace. Jesus brought this message of peace. Jesus' ministry was not disconnected from the world. It was not contrary to the things of the world. What God had spoken through his prophets earlier was that which he was standing on. <coughs> there were, after all, what he was communicating, after all, was the words that God had given him to speak. Jesus is himself, the very word. You know, we find that in John's writing. In chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning it says, was what? The Word. And the Word was? The Word was God. In the beginning was the Word, but the Word was God. Communicating this message is important. This Word was God. Jesus himself is the very word that needs to be communicated in the season that we are in. He is the incarnate. God incarnate. His message exceeded those of the prophets by far because it is the fulfillment of everything that was spoken of in the Old Testament by the prophets. He is that fulfillment. How do we know that? He is the Christ the anointed one. He is Jesus, Jehovah, or salvation. He is Emmanuel, God with us. You know, it will be somewhat similar to a man asking a woman to marry him. Yes is the answer the man would be looking for when he asks her. He's looking for that yes. But the I do, 
that comes at the commitment of marriage is the reason he's asking the question in the first place. He wants to be able to see the fulfillment. The request is made, will you marry me? The yes starts the process. The I do, the I do is the fulfillment of that. The goal, the actual completion. It is in this same way in Isaiah's prophecy where he writes and talks about a suffering servant. In Isaiah 53.10. We can see those words. Making an offering for the guilt of all humanity. But the, the offering that comes in the prophetic writings of Isaiah is actually climaxed or superseded by Jesus' own words in John's writing, chapter 19, verse 30, when he says these words. It is finished. It is finished. So what began now climaxes in a finished work upon Calvary's cross. And Jesus himself is that offering. But if he had not come, how different would things be? If he had not come, all these things that we just talked about would be null and void, right? Tim, do you have a clip? We're going to do something here. We're going to use a familiar clip that I know everybody's familiar with this time of the year. Hey, what's the matter with you? Look where you're going. you through is obviously what life would have been like if he would have not lived. Think about that. As people today, I wrote down a note. Each individual's life, each and every one of us in here today, each and every one of our lives touches someone else some way or another. Do we realize that? Have you ever given thought to if you were not here? How different would things be? If Jesus had not come, how different would things be? I'm going to share a story. I told you it was a little bit extended. Some more parts of this. Every now and then, we ourselves might say these very words. I wish this, or I wish that. There might be some say, I wish I would have never been born. Just bear with me. I want to share this story. It's a Christmas wish 
by Andrew Sharp. The wet snow, and it follows the very pattern of what you just saw here in the way of a video. The wet snow steeped into George's socks as he leaned on the bridge railing and stared down at the dark river below. It was too dark to admire the scenery, the black bare trees hunched over with loads of snow weighting them down. Anyway, he was too angry to appreciate any uplifting landscape. Instead, he shuffled through the memories of the ugly scenes of the past few months. As his congregation had had a dispute and there was splintering factions about this, that, and the other thing. And there was so much disarray within the leadership that this pastor could not take it anymore. And he felt it was necessary to remove himself from all these events. His frustration had been building since before the squabbling ever started. And finally, he had come to this place as he stands here in this bridge. He was willing to do whatever it took to end his pain. He was willing to look past the shining lights of the season into the black shadows of the depth below. There was those that would admit that Jesus lived, but one leader within his church was caught up in a sexual disaster and took many lives down with them. The so-called church of love was torn apart by hate, by anger. Worse, there was that of pointing, this was pointing the church in a steady direction into the hands of the very enemy that is against God. But beyond that, looking around the world at all the conflict, all the wars, all the things that there are quests for political power, thousands of various sects committing, committing for land, Add to that the suffering of cancer and disease, pandemics. All these things were bubbling over now in his heart. Prayer, Bible study, or Bibles being banned from schools. Is this the kingdom of God? He asked. Then I want nothing to do with it. I would have been better if Jesus had not come. If he were only a deluded man, George could have forgiven him. But in effect, this mess and this humiliation that he was feeling had come within the very church that he was trying to help. His thoughts were startled as he heard a splash as it broke the silence and a voice shouting, help. As he dove in to help, as he heard this despairing cry from this dark, the very adrenaline in his body took over. Inside the police station, George tried to dry his hair with a towel and glared at the man sitting across from him. He was a short, very square-jawed man, covered with stubble. He would have looked natural carrying a Tommy gun and wearing a, a trench coat. He seemed completely on trouble by this fall into the river, almost amused. George had difficulty imagining him jumping from a bridge for any reason. Think about that. What do you think you were doing there, George said. You could have gotten both of us killed. The police officer standing nearby nodded his head. Why, I was just saving you, the man said. Saving me? Sure, instead of jumping in to drown, you jumped in to save me, the man. Very touchy, you see. I'm an angel sent to you, he grinned. But George started to protest. And he narrowed his eyes. Hey, wait a minute. Is this a joke? You think you're going to pull some wonderful life stunt over my eye, over me? You might think I'm going to rush home to Mary after all this is over. And we're going to sing old Ang Syne. By the way, my wife's Sarah, so you're out of luck. George was offended. Your wife could get married to any number of people, the angel explained. 
Lots of good pastors out there, he reflected. Bad luck for your kids, though, I guess. He took out his pipe and filled it with tobacco. George says, I hate smoking. By the way, angels don't smoke. He said, I'm, I'm sorry. Since when do they not smoke, the angel said, puffing uncontrollably. The policeman was edging closer to the door, and the angel saw him. Don't get too excited. Come back here and sit down. The policeman found his legs and walked back to his chair. George became angry. I was, suppose you think I'll be upset about this. I'm going to change my lighting here a little bit. I suppose you think I'll be upset about this. Well, I don't feel any different. I don't doubt that, the angel said to George. I think you know the drill, the angel said. Let's go around and take a look at the scenes depicting life without Jesus. The room faded and George found himself standing in the crowded city. He blinked up at the Greek structure nearby and recognized it as the Supreme Court building. A large crowd of protesters milled around, half holding signs with religious mementos in magic marker and the other half waving messages demanding the separation of religion and state. Police officers scuffling to try to control the crowds. George was bewildered. I thought you said Jesus was never born. He howled over the crowd and the noise that was there. He wasn't, the angel said. They're still mad about the Ten Commandments being taken down. They di I didn't say that religion never happened. George was upset. That's not fair, he yelled. You're telling me this happens without Christianity? The angel said, yes, people are still people. Still, George insisted, think of the, the horrible things Christianity has brought. The Crusades, he shouted triumphantly. Funny you mentioned that, the angel said. The mob faded and was replaced by a dusty square in a village, and George guessed they were somewhere in the Middle East. Women were drawing water from the well. They were chanting with each, chatting with each other. The old man was sitting at the edge of the square, snoozing in the afternoon. Suddenly, the old man coughed and violently pitched over and fell on his face. A group of horsemen covered with steel, head to toe, were clattering through. Running, people were running and screaming. Villages were, villagers were actually run down. No, George screamed. The angel touched him gently on the arm and the scene faded. They stood in the darkness. You don't have to watch that, he said sadly. You know what happens anyway. George actually threw up. He wiped his mouth, he stammered. It's not possible. Without the church, why should they? People find plenty of reasons to be angry. The angel's voice came out of the dark. You know the oil industry. You know politics, democracy. You know saving the motherland, revenge, all these things. Even those who call themselves critical thinkers. They have a religious veneer, but that's it. Fine, George said with a little shrug. But at least people don't have to waste their time bickering with theology, minute problems. You forget there's still religion, the angel said. The darkness brightened and George found himself standing in the back of a seminary classroom. Hey, that's Professor Reed, George whispered. I hated his class. We spent hours discussing stuff that no one really understood. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? He snuffed. And so concerned, and so the concept of God's priest person, I'm sorry, personhood underwent a subtle and important shift. Professor Reed droned. 134, the angel said. Say what? Angels that can get on the pin, he said. George looked and blinked. Only if you're trying to set the record, though. 30 is the number. George opened his mouth to say something but the scene changed. Music played, people swayed. They were swaying to the music. Didn't have the bouncy snap that George was used to. George's throat felt hoarse. He realized he was shouting at them. He put his hand over his mouth. People began to file forward and kneel at the altar. George recognized 
old Mrs. Nelson, of course. She was one of those who never missed an altar call. And she was looking at the ceiling, tears streaming down her cheeks. There was something flashed in her hand. George leaned forward to look. He almost passed out when he saw that she was cutting herself with a knife. Wait, stop, he shouted, running forward. Don't do this. You can never atone. The only one who, and then he stopped. They have to prove their devotion, the angel said. Can they? George asked. Well, he knew the answer, didn't he? No, the angel said, looking away. But surely God won't stand for, stand, I'm sorry. Surely God won't send them to, the angel looked at him. No, they're already there. George felt an emptiness that almost went beyond pain. It was hope. He realized there was, wasn't any. There was nothing that he could do at this point. Yet he could see the hopelessness that was all around him. All right, he gasped. I was all wrong. Take me back now. That only happened in the movies, the angel said. This is real. Jesus never came. This is, there is no plan B. This is what you wanted. This is what your wish was. George tried to <laughs> suck in air but couldn't. For you, anyway, the angel explained, changing history, you see, creates a parallel time stream. Never mind, too hard to explain. George began to weep, but I love him. I miss him. I need the life he gives like I need water. He reached for a shred of hope. He might never have come, but he exists. You said, you said yourself that God existed. That means that Jesus, I knew, still exists. The angel sighed. You don't get it, do you? Of course he does, but not the man who was tempted like you. The man never existed. The Son of God can't have anything to do with you. It would kill him. George snatched a knife from one of the pews. But the angel grabbed his wrist. George fought him wildly, but the angel held him with no trouble. Let me go, George shrieked. Why don't you, why do you care? I'm dead anyway. Then they were sitting in the police station again. I lied, the angel said. You had to really believe to really understand. Think about that. To really believe, to really understand. How many of us understand? If he had not come, what would be the lot for each and every one of us in here today? Why would we even be here? You know, really, when you think about it, it's, impo it's an impossible question. Because we don't know what life would be like. We don't know what life would be like if we weren't here. But we know those that we have made contact with would be different. Because we wouldn't know each other. The whole universe is in him. Jesus. The whole universe works and operates through him. It speaks to that in Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him <coughs> and for him. But you know, when we start considering these things, we have a different appreciation. Coming to consider some of the numerous individual blessings that we have experienced. Do you count your blessings? Do you consider what has come your way? We're going to look at four things here briefly. If Jesus had not come, we would not know God's complete fullness. We would not know the fulfillment of the last promise, including the very first one he made. Where do we find the first promise in God's Word? What book of the Bible? Genesis. They want to know what chapter? How about chapter 3? How about verse 15? And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise 
his heel. Who was God speaking to at this point? Saint. He was being told that he was going to pay a price. I want you to think about it. The Bible says, Richard King James says, he will put enmity between man or the enemy and God. I want to just share a couple synonyms. I want to give you something to think about. Synonyms for enmity. Hostility. Antimosity. Antagonism. Fiction. Opposition. Dissension. Rivalry. Feud. Conflict. Discord. <coughs> contention. Bitterness. Rancor. Resentment. <coughs> dislike. You know, these things are all ill feeling things. You know, we played that song, we sang that song, I heard the bells on Christmas Day. Some of the things in there is viewing what the world is portrayed like. And it's all around us, folks. It's all around us. Ill feeling, bad feelings, ill will, bad blood, hate. What's the song say? Hate is what? Strong. Hate is strong. There is things, there's dissension, there's malice, there's spite. There are those that are spewing venomous type actions towards one another. If Jesus had not come. Secondly, if Jesus had not come, we will not know the fullness of God's love. Do you know God's love today? You know, I realize we all have struggles, do we not? But to know His perfect, unconditional love. John 15, 13 <laughs> says, Greater love hath no man than this, than he what? Lay down one's life for his friend. Jesus gave Himself for you and I. Do you believe it? Do you accept it? Are you walking in it? We need to get this message out to the world because there's people who are, what's the uh, prophets say, there's people walking in darkness. But we need to see this great and glorious light. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us while we were yet what? Sinners. While we were yet sinners, he demonstrated his love. The demonstration came how? Christ died for us. Third, if Jesus had not come, we would not know the depths of God's humi humanity and his humility. Jesus came. God came in the person of Jesus in body form to walk among us to demonstrate to us his humility toward us. According to Hebrews 2.17, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in the service of God and to make a propitiation for our sins. Our sins. Jesus was made like us. Yeah, I believe that's the thing that we have trouble grasping. That God would take on the form. You know, if you really study the words out in Genesis, in creation, when we look at what took place there, and then you get to John, and you again do the same type of thing. Look at how it's portrayed, and how Jesus, we, we all agree, I believe, that Jesus always was. He just didn't happen. He was there in the beginning. And John's writings tell us that he is there in the beginning, was the Word. And the Word was God. You look at these things, the difference in wording as you go through shows us that something different took place when this baby was born in Bethlehem. The word born is significant. Jesus always was. But what took place in that birth in Bethlehem was a different transformation 
of who and what God is. He did so that we might have him as an advocate on our behalf. Finally, last thing. Finally, if Jesus did not come, we would not know his atoning death and life-giving resurrection, and thus we would not know salvation. Are you saved today? Do you know Jesus Christ in a personal way today? Is he your Lord? Romans 5.10, If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? His death, his blood, allowed us to come to that place that we could come before God. But his life is our hope. The tomb's empty, right? There's, Jesus is not in that tomb. Seeing and enjoying Jesus in a matchless relationship as the Son of God, embodied. God is embodied in that <clears throat> created or human form to bring blessings to each and every one of us. <coughs> this is for us the most urgent message on our plate today. To not only live it, to not only share the love in it, but to tell others about it. There's a lot of lost souls out there. You know what God needs to do, and we've been talking about this over the past few weeks, we need fresh spiritual eyes to see. You know, I realize people like to see the Christmas lights, like to see Christmas decorations. I enjoy those kind of things too. But we need true spiritual eyes to see the glory that God has brought forth in Bethlehem. Who grew up into adulthood and lived among men. But he also needs to help us open our ears. We need to hear. We need to hear. You know, over the years, there's, you know, I don't care whether it was raising my son, and I'll probably tell you, I probably said this a time or two to them. We need to keep our mouths shut. If you want to learn, you need to keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open. You can learn much more. Well, my prayer would be that the grace of God's perfect gift in Jesus Christ might come into each and every home this Christmas season. That there would be a healing take place like never before. Do we need it? Yes. When we think of that song, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, the words of that song are haunting because we are living in a difficult time. But praise be to God, Jesus did come. Amen. Did he? Yes. He came, he lived, he died, he rose again, <laughs> and even now is interceding on our behalf. Once you see a closing clip, we know it. What would life be if it wasn't for Jesus? Where would we be if he had not come into our life to be our personal Savior, to allow us to make contact with those around us and live? Clarence! Clarence! Help me, Clarence! Get me back! Get me back! I don't care what happens to me! Get me back to my wife and kids. Help me, Clarence, please. Please. I want to live again. I want to live again. I want to live again. Please, God, let me live again. <laughs> hey, George. George. You all right? Hey, what's the matter? Now get out of here, Bert, or I'll hit you again. Get out of here. What the Sam Hill are you yelling for, George? You. George. 
Bert, do you know me? Know you? <laughs> you kidding? I've been looking all over town trying to find you. I saw your car piled into that tree down there, and I thought maybe you... Hey, your mouth's bleeding. Are you sure you're all right? What you... <laughs> My mouth's bleeding, Bert! My mouth's bleeding! Zuzu's pedals! Zuzu... There they are! Bert! What do you know about that? Merry Christmas! Well, Merry Christmas! I know we all know this chorus. And we're just going to sing it before we depart. And again, I realize it's been a little longer. We do have things back here, so please don't cut out. <laughs> I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take a special blessing upon your people here this morning. I pray that there be a stirring in the spirit. I pray that there be a freshness anew come alive in each and every one of us. Lord, thank you for that work that you came to do. Thank you for the love that you shared along the way. Thank you, Lord, for making a way for your people. We do love you. We give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless and come again tonight, then I'll say Merry Christmas. <laughs>